it was around my 12th birthday that um, I got a record of John Swallow. The old-fashioned LPs. It was pretty big. And it had this picture on the front. And there was John sitting in a suit, holding his trombone. And he had a big smile on his face and a crew cut. And I just looked at that album before I even listened to it. Just looking at the picture. Looking at his lips. Looking at the dental structure. <laughs> I was 12, but I was fascinated by it. And was already extremely serious about uh, playing the trombone for my career. I knew that when I was nine. Anyway, then I put on the recording and I was flabbergasted. Um, that recording, um, recorded in the mid-60s, I believe, I think on Golden Crest. I used to think it was Crystal, but I, I think it's Golden Crest. And um, trombone and pier piano. I think it's at Harriet Wingreen piano. And he was playing pieces. Um, he played the Saint-Saëns Gavatine. It was the premier recording of the Alec Wilder sonata for trombone and piano. And if there's any solo that makes me think of John, it's that one. It had such a freeness in it, and his playing had such a freeness, a, such a vocal aspect, that um, that piece really reminds me of him. And then he played Corelli Sonata in F. He also played the Blue Bells of Scotland, <laughs> at the speed of light, <laughs> that last movement. Um, and I was just taken by that recording and listened to it all the time. <clears throat> and he played very, very differently than the people that I studied with in high school, which were of Ronald Ricketts of the Minneapolis Symphony, which became a couple of years later the Minnesota Orchestra, and the principal trombone, Stephen Selmer. Uh, they played very differently. Uh, Ricketts, Ronald Ricketts, probably played a little closer to John Swallow. He had a certain kind of crisp technique and fluidity. Zelmer was very kind of noble in his sound and very basic, loved the basic things about the trombone and its place within the orchestral literature. And John Swallow um, was very versatile. And he didn't necessarily come from one school of playing. As a matter of fact, I remember that he told me, once I started studying with him at New England Conservatory in 1973, he told me that um, he chose to play the way that he did. Because this big orchestral sound was coming into it, and I was certainly very into it of a certain kind, which is different than today's big orchestral sound, but similar in a sense. And um, I played in a way that was very different to him, but I wasn't blinded by the fact that he played differently. because I could hear that spirit in his playing. I could hear him in it, his life in it. Now, I wouldn't have put those words to it when I was 12 or 13, but that's what I could hear. And so, I'll never forget my first lesson. It was on Yom Kippur. It was the first Yom Kippur that I didn't go to the synagogue. Um, at that particular time in my life. It was my first time being away from home in 1973. I was a freshman at New England Conservatory. And I was so, I mean, almost in disbelief that I was actually going to have a lesson with the person I looked at for years on this recording and would listen to. And so I didn't prepare myself for the fact that, hey, wait a minute, he might not look like the recording anymore. So when I came to the lesson, 
was October 6th, 1973. And I peeked through. I thought, who's that? <laughs> his hair was longer. He didn't have that crew cut anymore. Um, he had a sports jacket on. And he was smoking a cigarette. <laughs> My other teachers weren't smoking cigarettes in the lesson. But a lot of people did during those years. And so I got to go in and I got to meet him. And he was so warm and, and just made you feel great. And I knew right away that he was really different. Very colorful language. Um, very warm, very human. And it was easy for me to hear a lot of that language. I kind of grew up in a house where people weren't too overly cautious about the language that they used. Very kind of open in that particular kind of way. And so I felt right at home <laughs> being with, with John. And he wanted people to call him John. He didn't say, now call me Mr. Swallow, because that's what I did. He said, call me John. And it was a great first lesson. He said, what about the legato? You know, he said, you sound like Mr. You sound like Steve Zellmer. He said, you know, you have a lot of things I can. He said, what about another kind of legato too, that you would be able to use the natural slurs as the model of your articulation. So you'd have to have a lighter articulation to match those natural slurs. And he accepted more of a la syllable. La, 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 la. So right in the first lesson, this different legato tongue and use of alternate positions really started to open up. And I took that advice, that first lesson, and I must say, in a certain way, I was an extremely good student because I used the first law of what a good student was. In my mind, that first law is immediate application. And I trusted him, and, and I was so happy to be with him. He said something, I did it. And I remember that first time after the lesson, I stayed and practiced and practiced and practiced. Next week I came, I could do it. It came pretty naturally. I think my legato tongue was kind of high up anyway, <clears throat> but not that high up. And it, you had to work with your air support different to do that. It's a whole different kind of thing. But I just loved different things that it, that it had me do. And um, I remember him saying the next lesson, he said, well, you caught on to that pretty quickly. And I got a beach book, Marcel Beach, got the top tones, um, this Simone Mantia book, and uh, Arbenz, and we worked on excerpts. He, know, he knew that, um, you know, I came into town and... I was working a lot already. I saw all these auditions up on a bulletin board, and I signed up for them, and I got them. And so he knew I really, my dream was to be in an orchestra. And uh, he didn't discourage me from excerpts, but he'd say to me, you know, one day you're really just going to end up playing quintets and solos. I looked and I'm like, really? And funny thing is, within a week or so, I was playing in the Cambridge Brass Quintet, which did a lot of youth concerts and a lot of other concerts. And a year and a half later, I was in the Empire Brass Quintet. So a lot of that was true. I, in my career, I did more of that than actually playing solos, even though I, I did play solos a lot. I played a lot in high school with orchestra and band. But he was trying to open up the whole thing and not be so fixed in just orchestra and just trying to get what that kind of thing would be. And I approached them musically anyway, and he encouraged that. He encouraged that in different approaches to the excerpts. Alternate positions on the Mozart Requiem. Alternate positions in the excerpts. Some of that is verboten, it seems, these days. But no. He had a different kind of mind, an incredibly creative mind, that wasn't fixed into one kind of thing. He wanted the versatility 
of expression. On the instrument and musically, he was very open to discovery because he, he himself was opening up new territory all the time. 